So uh, hopefully you're here for uh, less the CSS preprocessor. Yes, head nod. Yeah, we're good. Just want to make sure everyone's in the right place. So uh, just a little info on me. I'm Jake Smith. Uh, I'm from uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, been a developer since '97, doing uh, a lot of front end and PHP and some Ruby on Rails. Uh, here's my contact information, blog, etc. If you want to jot that down, if you have any questions after the talk, I can't address, and you, you don't get a chance to ask me or you think about it tomorrow, just hit me up online. I have one question. How many days have you been up coding when that picture was taken? Because you look really tired. <laughs> I was quite tired. I forget what, that was in Austin somewhere. I don't know, I was out on a patio working on my vacation, so maybe that's why I was a little upset. <laughs> So what is less? So as I said before, it's a CSS preprocessor. Um, one thing I, I always try to say about less is the syntax tries to be as close to CSS as possible. So it's a very easy transition for uh, people who are uh, CSS developers or people who do a lot of front end. It's a real easy transition in. Uh, SAS is a little more, I don't know how I want to describe it. Programmatic, I don't know, it's not as, in line as less is. And you'll see that through the examples. And once again, one of the big advantages of using less or any other preprocessor is the organization in your code. So helping you to be dry. So this is the actual definition of what less is. I think I got it off their site or something. So it's an extension to CSS. Less is not only backwards compatible with CSS, but extra features are added to it. So the big question is, what is, less is not? It is not going to solve your IE problems. I am sorry. <laughs> there is no tool for that. You are... You can help with managing them, though. <laughs> uh, may, maybe. And it's not going to save yourself, save you from yourself. So if you are writing bad CSS, less isn't going to clean it up and say, poof, awesome CSS comes out. That's not the case either. So variables. This is probably one of the biggest things and like everybody who's ever done CSS is like, oh my gosh, if I just had variables, life would be so much better. I wouldn't have to redefine this hex color 20,000 times and stick a, uh, a table of contents at the top of my CSS stating this hex is this color. Now we actually have variables for that and less. So right here, I have all my uh, hex colors all easily readable, so I know exactly what color that is, and I can reuse it everywhere in my uh, less file. Also, you can actually store something like, uh, like a path. So if you had different paths to stuff that you wanted to reference, like thumbnails or profile paths, and you were referencing that in your CSS, you could actually store that as a string there. I also like to uh, do uh, font stacks, so I'll put them in a variable also. So if I have a serif or a sans serif uh, font stack, or just a particular theme that needs a different type of font stack, I'll create a variable for it so I can just reference that right there. So that makes it really useful for me. Now I put this slide in here just because Les can do it. I see absolutely no reason or point to having it. Really, I should probably just take the slide out because it's really pointless to me. But you can have a variable called fnord and then have another variable where the value is fnord and you do that. Meh. So, what does that do? So essentially, so it pretty much takes the value uh, of this right here. So you see the value is fnord. So you have a variable name of fnord. So that's what it would actually output. Oh. Yeah. You see, it's you see, it's quite pointless and less. I don't know why it just got added in there because a lot of languages already do it. So nesting. So. I have a simple example of uh, my nest here. So we have an, an A tag here, so we have a link. And then a lot of times you're gonna have a hover or a visited or some other pseudo class that you want to apply. So I stored it inside of my actual block right here. And you'll notice this little ampersand right here. So it's saying I want to be touching its parent element. So the output would actually be the A with the A hover and the A visited. So, okay, well that's awesome. Well, let's, let's go a little deeper then. So let's say I have a tweets class. Now in this tweets, we're just saying it's a ULLI. So I'm gonna have my UL, then I'm gonna do the LI, then I'm gonna do the A. Oh, it's just, it's all one big package. It's awesome, great. 
So you see the output, tweets, tweets UL, tweets UL li, tweets UL li a, hmm. There's a problem with that. So I'm really ex uh, uh, bloating my specificity when it's not necessary. Like I could easily shorten that. But I was like, okay, well, I'm just following my HTML structure. You know, UL li a, I'm just going to see that you don't do that because you're going to absolutely blow up your CSS. It's going to over-specify, and you're going to start having specificity battles nonstop. So nesting is good, but with rules. So only nest when you really need to. So I, uh, I just kind of took it back a step. The tweets UL, the LI, and the A outside. So all I need to do is reference tweets A, or tweets LI, or tweets UL and I'm covered for this example. So I brought, brought back the specificity, and so it's no longer a major pain. Now once again, this is a very simple example. You could really blow it up real bad. So one rule I kind of, so the rule I tell people is never go more than three uh, levels deep on your nesting. If, you did, if you're planning on doing that, you're doing something wrong. With that said, I personally have started just doing it for my, uh, for my pseudo classes. So like you saw with the hover and the visited and stuff like that, I felt that's a better way of controlling the specificity and not bloating it out. So I really don't use the nesting as much anymore just because of the chance of bloating your CSS, in my opinion. <clears throat> so uh, something new to LS1.3 that just uh, is something recent. Uh, you can actually uh, do uh, an import like uh, right here. So I have... Uh, so this is a media query, and hold on a sec, did I do that backwards? No, no, I did it right. Okay, just want to make sure. Kind of got lost there for a second. So we have a media query called a media screen and a max width of 400, and I have my, uh, my stuff in there. Then I have another class declaration called dot grid, and inside of there, I do a media query uh, inside of it. So what Les is smart enough to do is it'll actually create, it'll wrap the media query with that right there. So you could actually uh, be so far deep and say, okay, for this class, I want uh, the media query to do this stuff. It's an easy way to organize, you know, all the stuff that's associated with that class. Now, what this example is showing is Les is not smart enough to merge them. So you see these media queries are the exact same. It would be more efficient if it would just add this inside of there. Sadly, less is not that smart when it comes to this, but it's still a very beneficial thing that you can do. Any questions so far or anything? Okay. So imports. Um, how many people have actually used the CSS import? You know why using the CSS import's bad? Okay, just checking. So. One of the th reasons that uh, I say that is if you're using the CSS imports that are built into CSS, every time you run your CSS, it's having a, a separate HTTP call out to the server for each CSS file you included. That is bad. That is going to slow performance on your site. Browsers have certain limits on how many files they can actually request at a certain time. Mainly the older browsers have the most issue, but less has its own import. Looks the exact same. The only difference is it actually loads it all into one file. So in the end, you have one HTTP request instead of 15. And it makes it easy for you to abstract out into different files what you want your CSS to be. So this is just kind of a basic example. Um, Fearless was the name of, uh, of a little mix-in library I had for a while. And so I just kind of broke it down into there and I just included stuff as I wanted. And then I had application-specific imports that were just specific to that particular product. And so that was just kind of my organization, but that's how imports work there. New to 1.3, though, uh, you can actually do imports inside of uh, declarations. So I have my dot .grid there, and let's say I have a grid uh, file that I want to include. Now, you notice I don't have to have the extension there if it's a less file. If it was a CSS file you were including, you'd have to actually put the .css. So let's say all this content was inside of that grid file. So it's going to just import all that and just drop it in right there inside of that grid declaration. 
that's pretty cool. What I'd like more is what you can do with media queries in the new import. So down here, you have at import mobile. So I have a mobile.less file, screen and width for max width of 400 pixels. And the output would actually put in whatever I had in my mobile.less inside of the media query right there. Pretty handy. So there was an issue before. So with less one, two, let's say I had a, uh, one of my external library files I was loading in. And let's say that had an import of something else. And that had an import of something else. Well, what's, what happens if I import the same file twice? Well, it would start duplicating the code. I started noticing when I had five of the same uh, declarations in the CSS, something was not right. So in 1.3, less implemented, import once. So it's saying only import this file once. Well, then, uh, then me and some others got on, their, uh, on the GitHub and we're like, hey guys, you know, this is usually just outputted, like, you know, compiled out to CSS. So import once really isn't a big deal. So shouldn't import just import once by default? And they're like, oh yeah, you're totally right. We should just do that. So import once lived for one, for I think one release. And in, in one four, it's being removed. So now import does import once. So no worries about that anymore. And 1.4 just released beta 3 three days ago. So it's on the verge of releasing. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the great new wonderful features that are coming out in 1.4 at the end. So string interpolation. So right here, um, some of the stuff I used is, so we have like an image path. So let's say you have like a CDN or something. And Let's say something went south with this CDN, and you're like, oh crap, I need to, I need to change CDNs. So we're like, okay, well, I guess I could grep everywhere where this is at, but that's, that's not fun. What if we just have a variable set up right there? All right, cool, so I can easily swap out whatever CDN I'm referencing these static uh, images in, or fonts, or whatever assets I'm loading into my CSS. And once again, there's still those are examples from the uh, paths and stuff I was talking about earlier. So right here is what you actually would use to put it in there. So you see the at symbol with the curly brace and then the variable name and the curly brace. That's how you would reference a uh, variable inside of a string. So I also do it down here with my sponsor path. And that's how I would just load stuff in like that. So it, using that's how I use string interpolation for a while. Now. Oh, dadgum, I forgot I had those things. Isn't it so much more helpful with that? <laughs> no more pointing at the red dot. Got ahead of myself. All right. So, new to less 1.3, they added in that you could actually put use uh, these uh, variables inside of the actual declaration also. So, what I just showed was you using it in the actual value. Now you can use it in the declaration. So I was just playing with it one day and I was like, okay, I'm just going to use the word red as an example, as my variable. Well, as you can see, Les took, my, uh, took what red is and actually gave me the hex of what red is. That's not really what I was thinking I wanted. Okay, I'll just wrap it in quotes. That's not really what I was looking for. So right here, I do the little tilde and that's what it actually escapes it. And so th I can actually get what I was really looking for, promo red box. Once again, this is just an oddity because I chose the word red and it happens to be a CSS color. And Les was trying to be cute and give me the hex for it. Uh, so smart, but sometimes just does not do what you want. So operations, not the game, but the actual operations here. So right here uh, I have, uh, a base color, so we have our uh, base, actually I can't tell you what that color is, I have no clue what it is, <laughs> but I can sit there and I can make it a little lighter by doing that plus CCC, so it's doing hexadecimal math right there, plus 333 and I'm making it a little darker. Now there's other functions I'll talk about a little later that are easier than that, it's just an example to show that you can actually do hex math. So right here I have my base padding and then I, do, I want to do a plus five to it. So that's going to make my padding uh, 10 pixel, or 15 pixel by 10 pixel. 
So you can sit there and you can update uh, your base padding, your base margins, whatever you want to use your variables for. And also you have stuff like this. So I'm, I have a uh, circle mix-in, which we'll talk about mix in just a little bit. But I want the uh, size variable to be here for the height and width. But for the border radius, I want it to be half the size. So I just do that right there. And that'll give me a nice pretty circle. And with my helpful stuff. See, I did all this stuff before I had the pointer. Now I got the pointer, I don't need it anymore. So, mix-ins. So, pretty much, I can uh, use just about anything. Any uh, class can be used as a mix-in, per se. So, I have my dot module declaration right here. Say in the background, color, font, whatever. We have our float left, and then I have news. But you see right here, I have dot module. And it's just the, it's just the class name. Well, what that's actually going to do is that's actually going to take every, uh, every property I have set in here and drop it in there. And it doesn't have to have any parentheses like this. But, once again, there is a uh, reason that you have those. So, let's say I had dot module with the parentheses, but nothing inside of it. And I you know, compile my uh, less out to CSS, module would not show up then in my outputted CSS because it is a mix-in purely just to be uh, used just as a mix-in. This so right... The parentheses suppress it from rendering? Yes. Okay. Well, it suppresses it from being in the CSS. This one right here is just a regular CSS declaration, but I can still use that anywhere I want, but that one will actually still be rendered in the CSS. So we have those two examples there, and so Right there, everything that's inside of those will end up in there, but they will not output to your CSS. So let's get to some actually useful uh, mix-ins. All the cool stuff you wanted to see. So um, I have a mix-in called rounded. And I have the uh, radius right here, which is my uh, variable that I passed in, and I have it, it says a default value of five pixels. Now, you, you remember, uh, for those who went in Justin's talk earlier, nobody wants to repeat all these, uh, all these uh, browser uh, prefixes. No one wants to remember them all. Nobody wants to do all that fun stuff. So I put them in once to this rounded mix-in, and I put the radius right there, and I'm done. Right here, I have shadow, and you can see you can put just about anything for the uh, predefined uh, variable. So, WebKit, box shadow, etc. Now, one of the cool things is, let's say I have a transition one, and I have three different uh, variables set up. Well, it would be kind of a pain to have to go who, duration, easing, who, duration, easing. So what Les has built in is what they call arguments. So it's gonna take every argument that's passed to your transition and drop it in there. So you don't have to repetitively do each variable name across. So it's going to take, let's say, I did transition, I didn't pass in anything. It would say all, half a second, ease out. And it would apply it to all the prefixes right there. Any questions so far? Or nothing? All right. So arguments is just, it's like implicit. It, it, it's everything. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the word arguments is always available inside of there and it'll take every argument you that you pass. pass no. No, no, it's automatically there for your use. So, Les has what they call mix-in matching. Now, I, have, I don't have too many wonderful examples on how to use it, but I have this right here. So, like I said before, the variable can be just about anything. So, let's say I uh, have a variable of switch and I set it to light. Well, I have, you see I define mix-in three times here. So I'm not overriding mix in every time. I'm saying if that's dark, I, w I, want, uh, I want you to do this right here. If that first variable is light, I want you to do this instead. This at underscore means I don't care what the first variable is, you're always going to do that. So this is your default. This will always be there if this mix in is called. 
the stuff inside of here is only applied if the first variable is light or this one is dark. So I pass in light, so we have mix in, we have the switch of light, and I pass in a color of 888. So it's going to output a uh, display block clone. I know I got, there we go, yep. Yeah. It's gonna find that one, and it's gonna say, hey, I want you to lighten the color by 10%. And it's also going to say, hey, there's a global one too. I'm gonna to apply that display block also. So the output is gonna have the display block from the global, from the at underscore, and it's going to have the color lighten from that one. Any, any questions regarding that? Yeah, it, it's one of the newer features that I haven't seen a lot of people utilizing too much, but it, it has its benefits for sure. So you saw right there where I was talking about uh, darken and lighten and stuff like that. So less has a lot of built-in functions and it has a lot of great color functions. So it has these as of right now. There's more of them coming out in uh, 1.4, I believe. So we have our lighten and darken, which I checked. So I, I did this right here. I wanted to see what would happen if I uh, put in a, uh, an RGB or hex or an RGBA as my color value or an HSL, whatever. I want to see what happens. So every time you use lighten or darken, you're going to get a hex back. So no matter what the value is put in, you're going to get a hex back for this. So darken is obviously going to darken it by whatever percentage you say. Saturate is going to saturate by 10%. Desaturate 10%. Fade in is going to fade in the color by 10%. Now fade out is actually going to return an RGBA because it's actually going to mess with the uh, the uh, alpha, and same with fade. It's going to mess with those right there. So it's going to give you an RGBA back for both of those. Now spin is pretty cool because, so imagine the actual like color wheel. And you're saying, hey, spin that color wheel how many, uh, how many degrees? So it's going to return you a hex, but it's going to, whatever color you put in, it's going to say, okay, spin that color wheel 10 degrees to the left, right, etc. And then we have mix. So it's actually going to mix two colors for you. Now, I have to double check the docs to see if they actually updated them, but originally the docs were wrong. They only told you you had to pass in the color one and color two. And uh, at least in less 1.2, I think 1.3 it doesn't matter anymore. But in less 1 and 2, or 1.2, it would blow up your less if you didn't pass in that third variable, even though the docs told you wrong. But what it does right here, just so you're clear on which color is taking on what percentage. So if I passed it 100% as that third variable, and my co first color was white, and the second color was black, it would return white. So if I want 50%, it's obviously going to be a gray. If I go below 50%, it's going to be more of the second color than the first color. So that's just something to take in consideration with mixing. So it's just a percentage of how far between the transitions? Between the color, yeah. Okay. So there's also uh, some math functions. And in 1.4, they're actually adding a ton of math functions. But here are the ones we have so far. So you can uh, round a number, get the ceiling. So you know the upper of the round or the floor, get the lower, so round down. And then you can actually tell it, hey, return me uh, an actual percentage right here. So right here, I uh, have a, uh, <coughs> essentially, it's uh, creating an arrow like uh, in pure CSS. So I'm using uh, floor at size divided by two. It's just so I have an, like a, uh, just a solid number, no decimal point or anything like that. So guards. So one, so one thing people talk about with uh, SAS is they're like, oh, well, SAS has conditionals like if and else. Well, less does too, but they call them guards. Remember what I said earlier, where, that less is trying to uh, strive to be as close to CSS as possible. So this is just a, this is a media query. I've shown a few of them already. So what less wanted to do is they're like, I want to stick to how CSS does things. So I'm going to do my guards or my if else in the form of a media query syntax. So I have dot ribbon here, and I have a width and a direction. So it says, when the width is greater than or equal to 200 pixels, apply this. 
So that's essentially how less is doing its own if conditional. It's just doing it like that. It's saying when that, then run this. So what if we had ribbon at width and direction? So when the direction equals left, oh, sorry, yeah, if the direction equals left or the direction equals right, then uh, run whatever inside this declaration. So just like in media queries, ors are separated by commas. And the ands are actually the word and. Now, I think this is my crazy one. Yeah, this is the one I wrote, I wrote out there just because if you say it out loud, it makes no sense whatsoever. So change to a percentage for responsive fluid, or maybe, yeah, change uh, to a percentage for responsive fluid layout. Sidebar at width, when not is percentage at width. Everybody got that, right? You understand what it's doing? <laughs> exactly. So it, it's, it's saying if, uh, if the width for the sidebar mix in is not a percentage, then go ahead and run this so we can update it to be a percentage so we can make this a more of a fluid layout. And then we also have a uh, path. So let's say I have an icon uh, mix in and I want to make sure that it's like an, like an external you know, URL or something. You know, when it's a URL, then do this. So if you want to do something crazy with an ex, uh, uh, icon that's linking to something that's external or using an external resource, you could do something inside of there. So there's just different things you can do with the, uh, the guards. Now there's also a couple other things you can uh, check on. So you have the unit checking of is pixel, is percentage, is EM. You have is color, is number, is string, is keyword, is URL, etc. So there's other things that you can actually check on with the guards. So namespacing and scoping in less. So uh, right here we have, uh, we have a wide theme. So literally just, it looks like just an ID and then we have stuff inside of it. Or actually this is over the scoping one. So I have my variable at primary and it's set to white. And we come down here uh, to the uh, module background and I'm gonna have that right there at primary. So that should be white. Then we get si inside of the white theme and I redefine it as black. Okay, well now that one's gonna be black. But what about down here at mobile theme? It's gonna be white. Because less contains stuff inside the scope. So we're inside the wide theme scope. So if you're used to JavaScript, you understand that it, it, it's kind of like uh, this. It's, it's keeping the scoping inside of the block right there. So like a global versus a local? Uh, well, I mean, the only reason it would be global is because it was defined in the global space. Yeah. So if it doesn't, so if it looks up in its uh, scope and says, hey, is there anything defined? Oh, okay, there is, I'll use that one. If it doesn't find anything, it's just gonna look up another level, and if not, then it would error out because it has to have a variable to reference. So if you commented out the top primary, you'd get an error because mobile theme knew, say, hey, this primary color is not available to my scope? Uh, well, if you did that, like, there'd be a bunch of failures because mm -hmm. module would fail because oh, there's, to to and then, now, that, like, if that, if, that, if, that, if that wasn't there, it would fail down here. Yeah. Exactly. I didn't, I didn't know yeah. So are imports once per scope or once per module? Import once. You talked about how import would default to only importing once. Is that per scope or is that per? No, no, no. Uh, import is universal. Like, like unless you actually define an import inside of a block, that's going to import it like wherever you say to import it. So at the top of like my uh, screen dot less, main dot less, wherever you want to call your file you would d usually do your imports at the top so it's easy to tell what you're importing there. Right, you just showed some examples where you're doing imports inside of scopes in some of the earlier stuff. Oh yeah, 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 I'm just saying that's an that's a ability you can. And that's just going to take whatever is in the content of that import and drop it in there. And then that would actually, if you're asking, would it read that variable? So if I, let's say I had an import of whatever I wanted, it would, it would be able to read the outside variable. Is that what you're asking? It was here it's the closest variable. Yeah, it, it would use whatever the closest variable. It, so it doesn't matter if a variable is set outside of that imported file, it could still read it. So namespacing. Um, 
Sometimes I just uh, do this uh, namespacing just, you know, to, for the reason namespaces exist, just to avoid conflict with other uh, libraries. So let's say I'm wanting to use a piece of Twitter bootstrap, and I just, I was like, I just want this piece. Oh, but this other library has this. I'm going to use this. Well, what if they have something that's conflicting? So essentially, uh, I have stuff I created. Uh, I created an arrow namespace. And uh, so right here, I have arrow, and I have a direction of left, right, up, and down. And then I have my ribbon. And so I have a ribbon of top and bottom. Now, one thing I just noticed is I don't have a slide that actually shows you how to use that, which is awesome. So we're going to jump out. So if I wanted to reference one of those, I could do arrow. Sorry. Or I could do. And that's how you would use that right there. That's essentially how namespacing is. It's, I don't know why they still call it namespacing. It's, I mean, it's, it's OK. It's not heavily used unless it's just something I just did just to make stuff a little more simplistic and organized. But essentially, I mean, if you look at it, it's just valid CSS. It's just an easy way to reference a method that's inside of something or a mixin that's inside of there. So, if you just look at this as just like plain CSS, this is just say, what is the parent sibling? Uh, give me top that is the parent sibling of arrow. And essentially, that's just the way it works for mixins. So you could actually call it like that. So, uh, right here, I wanted to give a few examples of uh, uh, applications or libraries that are using less right now. So there is uh, the 320 and up, which is uh, pretty much a uh, start from the uh, mobile out type of mindset. So uh, it's a, I guess you'd say it's a framework or boilerplate code for uh, doing mobile first. So they, uh, they utilize less, as many people probably already know. Twitter Bootstrap is made in less. And for both of these projects, I've looked, and someone has gone out, and they forked it, and they did it in SAS, or they did it in Stylus. So you can find forks for pretty much any repo. If there's a SAS project, chances are somebody went and forked it and did a less version of it. It's just kind of the, ha the way it is. So we've talked about all this cool stuff, but you know, how are we actually going to get the CSS? So. There is uh, doing uh, less in the browser. So you can actually uh, do this right here, where you actually drop in the link, link rel here, style sheet less, blah, blah, blah and, and then have the uh, script less.js, and then it would actually update it constantly in the browser for you. I personally do not recommend doing this at all. Please don't do this. I merely put it up there because it is available. This is not good practice. Because what happens when you put this in production? You're going to have that JavaScript sitting there recompiling your CSS every page load. Yes, it has, it has the ability to do caching and stuff like that, but that's no. Don't do this. Please don't. Don't ever do that. Instead, why don't you do it, com uh, compile it before it goes up to your server? And there's many ways you can do this. My personal favorite is CodeKit. This is the saving grace of all things that are preprocessors. So CodeKit will sit there and watch my files. And if I update any of my ls files, any of the imported files that are in my screen.ls or anything, it will automatically compile it out from less into CSS, and it'll actually refresh the browser page for me. So nice. Uh, but also the great thing about CodeKit, it does SAS, it does Stylus, it does CoffeeScript, it does Haml. Uh, what else does it do? Haml, CoffeeScript. I'm sure there's some other stuff that it also does. but. If there's anything that's pre-processed, good chance CodeKit can do it for you. And um, it, like, if you click on the actual uh, less file, it'll actually list out all the uh, files that are being imported by that less file. And you can also tell it, hey, I want you to minify this or compress this or whatever. So CodeKit's really helpful. Yes, it is a paid product. It's $25, I think. Well worth the investment. Uh, CodeKit is only for Mac, but I, ha I do have a, a window 
window app that I will show. Then there's Less App, which is made by the same guy who made CodeKit. Once again, this one is also Mac only. This is the free version that you can uh, download and use. I think he, it's either three to five years. I think he said he's going to keep updating Less App and then he's discontinuing it. But Less App is free. CodeKit is much, much better in my opinion, but it's also paid. So if you just want to try out Less or something, you could use the Less app. There's also Simple Less, which is very similar to the Less app I just showed. But as you can see, Windows and Mac. So hooray. And it's actually pretty clean. I've tried it out. I've get, uh, given it to coworkers to use who didn't want to pay for CodeKit, and that's fine. There's also uh, Live Reload, which isn't as pretty, but I think it's supported in Linux, Mac, and Windows. It is also paid, but it, like CodeKit, it can pre-process anything. So it's really helpful. Or if you just prefer doing it on the command line, you can use uh, node uh, npm and install less and literally just run this command. So we have less c because the command less is already taken. Screen out less, so that is my uh, less file that I want it to uh, do it on. Then I want my outputted file to be screen.min.css and I want you to uh, minify or things just compress it. You can uh, do the dash x. You can do a dash yui compress and it'll actually do the uh, Yahoo user interface uh, minifier on it and really pack it in. So really helpful stuff right there for uh, using it. If you just want to do the command line or let's say you have a uh, build script or something that you're running on another server and you want this to just run after you've committed some code or something, this is where it could be really helpful. Does yeah. that watch um, recompile every time you save it, or is that a one-time thing? That's a one-time thing. Okay. Yeah, there is no, there is no watch. Uh, so uh, the, the, the original creator of Less, um, I only know his screen name. I keep forgetting his actual name. It's Cloudhead. Anyways, he has already come out and said he is not going to add a watch to the command line for Less. Okay. He... Uh, he takes upon the principle, he's like, he wants Les to do one thing and do one thing great. And he's like, there's plenty of other tools out there that can watch files for you and you can tell it to run that command for you. He's like, so I'm taking the view that that's the way you should do it. So that's why he, because uh, I think SAS does a watch to the command line and that's one thing people like, but he said that that's never going to be in Les. Yes? So I use this currently right now, but one, one thing that I wasn't liking about a pre like automatic saving is when, when you're importing other less files, mm -hmm. and I save that file that's imported, but I don't, I don't actually want that file to be converted into a CSS file. I just mm -hmm. want the original one to be. Yeah. How do you prevent that from happening? Um, use CodeKit. CodeKit will, CodeKit will do that. Okay. So CodeKit is uh, smart enough to know uh, what files are being imported. And it won't make a... like when you save that, it'll just output the one file that the main, the file that you want to be outputted to. And you can actually go into the code kit. If it does try to output that one, you can just go into it and say no. But it actually auto does that really well. Okay. Yeah? There's also, uh, depending on what server you're using, there's a whole, like, I know there's, there's a less compiler for PHP, there's one for Ruby. Yeah, I wouldn't there's, use any of those. <laughs> well, but uh, for anyone using Node, like Express actually comes, the latest Express, uh, if you use the less option, it installs less, less. middleware, which mm -hmm. will automatically recompile it if you just access something with .css in the same directory as the last file you want and mm -hmm. protect it. Um, so at least for anyone using Node.js, Node like okay. so I never have to use a watcher like this. I just refresh the page. And yeah. Works. Well, yeah, if you're actually using something like Express, yeah, that would work just fine. Uh, yeah, no, there are alternatives for less PHP and the old Ruby one, which was it, don't use those. They're not being updated like the new less, and everyone is using this version. CodeKit, all, everything, they're going off of this version of less. So don't use one of the other ones. So this is the less.js one. And if you go to lesscss.org, that is the website. So less versus SAS. So Pretty much everybody, every time I give a presentation like this or have a conversation, it's always like, why not SAS? SAS is way better. SAS has Compass. You know what? That's awesome. It, it does. Compass is cool, but I mean, what is Compass? It's a, it's a mix-in library that's maintained by some really smart people. That's great. There's also Less Hat, which it's lesshat.com, I believe. It's, a, it's newer to uh, Less, but it does everything Compass does and some. 
One thing that uh, Compass does that I think is amazing is the uh, sprite generator that's pretty much built into SAS. So I could actually uh, pass in a, a sprite and it would, uh, or pass in the images and it would actually create the sprite for me. That's one thing I think SAS is awesome for and it's really cool. But I create my own sprites anyway, so it's not a big deal for me. Here's two things at the moment that uh, SAS can do that less cannot that really stand out to me. So there's the SAS extend. So you saw earlier when we actually called on a, a mix in or we called on a, a CSS class and I told you it brought in everything that was inside of there and dropped it inside of that uh, spot. Well what extend does, instead of actually pulling in that code and dropping it in there, it just takes the class name of the one you were referencing and just d puts it onto that uh, declaration right above it and just comma separates it. So that way you're not actually duplicating the actual property declarations or property definitions. Um, this is coming in less. Next version. Uh, string interpolation can be applied to the property. So you saw where I did it in the actual declaration. You saw where you can do it to the value. You still can't do it to the property in less. Don't know the reasoning behind it, but much smarter people who are working on an actual, the actual app probably know why. Or if you just do what I do and just go, you know, go hoard through their, all their uh, GitHub stuff, you'll find the answer real quick. So I also have gotten questions on, you know, hey, you know, preprocessors are stupid. They bloat my CSS and they do bad things. No, they don't. That's you. Any, anybody who's saying, you know, this, this bloats my code or this does that or this, it's no, it's, it's you. It's, it, you're, you're bloating your code. Remember when I said about the nesting thing, try to avoid the over nesting, the over specification. Important stuff you don't need to. You know, if you just, you know, take your time, be careful with what you're doing, you're not going to bloat your code. You will actually minimize and be a little more drier. So what's next? So there's a lot of cool things coming in less and they just released beta three, three days ago. So I'm assuming we are on the verge of the new version of less. So extend functionality. Yay, it's finally here. After all the SAS is way better because it has extend, that's about to be put to rest. So less is taking a different approach on how they're going to use the extend functionality. They're actually uh, using it more of a, uh, of a uh, pseudo class or essentially or pseudo mix in whatever you want to call it. So I would just whatever declaration I wanted to uh, extend something I would uh, put this colon extend and then I put the inside of it the declaration I want uh, to extend from. So that's how uh, the format of the new less is going to be. Um, all math uh, will have to be wrapped in parentheses. So you saw I had a few examples that weren't wrapped in it. Well, as of 1.4, everything will have, all math functions will have to actually be wrapped in parentheses to work. Uh, let's see here, variables can be used. Okay, so you can actually now start to use uh, variables as the default values of your mixins. So let's say I have a dot module and I have my uh, width for the local variable. I can actually use at the base width variable somewhere else as the default value for that mixin. So that's something you couldn't do before unless. And there is a ton of uh, math functions being added to uh, less, power pi, tan, sin, cosine, etc. And then uh, you have the convert function. So anytime you do any kind of mathematical stuff with uh, like an em plus a pixel and stuff like that, the results are never what you expect. Like it's just never, it's never quite right. So uh, what they're doing now is there's actually now a convert function being added to less and it'll be out in 1.4 to where you can actually, okay, let's do it. Uh, so if I wanted to add this 5EM to a pixel, I would do a convert 5EM to pixel. Then I do the plus, you know, whatever the pixels I'm wanting to uh, do the math on. So that's some of the cool new features that are coming out to less. Like I said, beta three released three days ago. I'm hoping by the end of this month uh, that it'll actually release and all this new fun functionality will be out and all the uh, less bashing will end with SAS. So any other questions, concerns, complaints? So you said it's actually beta three of 1.4. Yes, okay. if, you, uh, if you do the install, you can actually specify that you want the at beta. Like, so it's like npm install less, was it? Probably want dash G for global. Well, yeah, yeah, you can do a dash G. I, I do dash G. And then it's like at beta. at beta, yeah. 
and it'll install the beta. So you could actually try it out right now if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, do you have this set up to work with the continuous integration? Uh, you Whoa. you could. Um, we're in the process of doing that at my uh, place right now. Uh, we're hoping hoping to get it done this sprint. Um, so we're doing all the uh, so after it. Uh, our Git hooks after he pushes it out to our uh, Jenkins server, uh, it will then run the uh, so we got Node and everything installed. So it's then it's going to actually run the lessee command on it and just output it there. That way we don't actually have to commit our uh, outputted CSS file, so we can actually have a Git ignore set up for that. That way, because the one pain point of doing uh, of committing your actual outputted CSS is you get merge conflicts on the CSS, which you really don't care about. You care about the less. The output is fine. Your local output is fine. When you get to the server, you could actually say, hey, run this less C uh, command, and then it would just output right there, and no worries about having to do it local, then pushing up. Does that answer? Yeah. OK. Some. Some. All right, that's cool. Anybody else? All right, well, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, like I said, I'd love some feedback on the talk. Uh, there's the link for the joined in, also QR code if you're still into that. Um, contact information again if you uh, have any further questions or something you think of next week or whatever just shoot me an email Twitter whatever so thank you